Will y'all please take a seat? If you're coming a little late, again, my name is John Almquist. I have the privilege, right, of being the pastor here at Springs Community Church. Glad you guys are here. Welcome. Oh, cool. All right. I would have made this work, but I'll take that. Uh, This one makes me look even shorter. I'm not as vertically gifted. I've asked for that gift a couple times. So far, I haven't gotten it. We'll see how it works out. I'll keep you guys posted. All that to say, y'all, welcome. Before we jump into that, I just want to start with a story. This past week, Friday morning, anybody remember Friday, the crazy rainstorm that came, right? Okay, heads are nodding. Well, hey, here's a, a moment where, let's just say I wasn't at my best, right? So Friday morning comes, Friday for me, I try to, I'm working towards it, take weekends, like that'd be my Friday, my Saturday, why? Obviously, I work Sundays. Um, so Friday morning, I try to go get away for a little bit of time. My wife and I, we bought a paddleboard. Surfboard you stand on and you paddle, right? We bought one of those, newer to New Braunfels. I've loved exploring the rivers here on it. That's just been a joy. Part of that, attempting to learn how to fish. I've been told, though, to call it fishing. You actually have to catch fish. I'm more cast repeatedly over the course of a couple hours. That's really kind of what I do. All that to say, though, it was Friday morning. I, I wake up. I go to get away, try to do it a little early in the morning, helped with some stuff just in and around the house. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to move out of these speakers way. But uh, just some stuff in and around the house. And then I look outside. I don't know, it's 8.30, something like that, maybe 8 a.m. And man, it is dark. It looks dark. My wife, she turns to our little one and says, hey, Lily, let's go outside now. Why? Because it's going to rain. And what would wisdom have you do in the middle of a thunderstorm? Come back in in the middle of rain, all that kind of stuff. Well, I look at that. I check the weather app. I see, hey, there's lightning, thunder coming. And I think to myself, no big deal right? So what do I do? I load up this paddleboard. I strap it down to the back of my truck. I grab a fishing pole. I throw it in the back, drive to the river. Of course, I, like all people, I'm human. So I stop for El Napolitos, grab two breakfast tacos, okay? Because I'm going to throw it in the bag with me. Take that as I go. Why? Because I'd love to spend a little bit longer out there. And what will keep me from coming back? You'd think a lightning storm. No, I'd probably get hungry, right? So I took the tacos with me. So I would say, I get to the river, I go down there, uh, Cypress Bend Park, kind of that area is where I go. I go, I carry the paddleboard, I unstrap it, I grab the paddle, I grab the fishing pole, I do not forget the tacos, grab all that, put the tacos in a bag, I come, I set the paddleboard in the water. It's still, man, it's dark. It looks like it's almost dusk, but man, the paddleboard's new. I'm thinking, man, this will be so much fun. I get on it, I start paddling, right? I paddle a little bit, I pick up the fishing pole, I start casting, not fishing, casting. All of a sudden, though, it starts to sprinkle. Just a little bit of sprinkle, not too bad. So I'm out there, I'm on the water. I said, hey, whatever, so I get wet. That's not that big of a deal. It's not even raining that hard. I keep casting. Five minutes doesn't go by. I'm I'm 50 yards from the, the takeout, right, where I just put the paddleboard in. I could turn around, I could be back. Two minutes. All of a sudden, I'm 50 yards. Next thing comes, rain. And when I say rain, I personally think that's an understatement. What I mean by rain is, you know how when you're driving in your car and you have the windshield wipers on all the way on, yet you still can't really see? Like, that's the type of rain I'm talking about. So there I am, out in the middle of a rainstorm, standing in the middle of a river, 50 yards right now from the takeout, soaking wet, and I think to myself, okay, let's be smart here. I've got tacos, so I have nourishment, right? Right? <laughs> But really, I still want to enjoy my morning. What should I do here? Takeout's not that far. I think, well, what's my number one issue right now? Is it the rain? No, but I was cold. So what do I do? In the middle of a lightning storm, I set down my metal fishing pole, and I pick up my metal oar. And I say, you know what I'll do? I'll paddle as hard as I can for 10 minutes. That'll warm me up. I'll feel better. And hey, I'm out in God's creation. I just start paddling down this river, man. And it's one of those rain, seriously, you couldn't see farther than football field. I'd say it that way. Just because rain was coming in sheets. I get to this point where the river kind of bends, right? And I even come out, there's this clearing in the trees. I look up, and I'm thinking to myself, man, God is the creator of everything. He's powerful. He's in control. He totally knows everything that's going on. And then all of a sudden, I just hear this crack, lightning. Right? There'd been some thunder, 
but I hear lightning. And again, I have a decision point. I want to be smart. So I think to myself, I could turn around and go back, or it looks like 100 yards ahead, there's a tree line. I can get under the trees. That way, if lightning strikes, it'll hit the tree first. So of course, I just keep going, right? I keep going. I cast my pole, all that to say, right? The worm's dragging through the waters. I'm paddling along, trying to enjoy my time. I get down there, man, and rain is coming Thunders hitting, lightnings cracking, and it's just getting closer. I share that because I'm standing out there and I'm thinking to myself, man, creation is beautiful. Man, God is powerful. And then it's like I started having a conversation with God. And God's like, hey, one, that's cool. Everything you just said is true, right? Glad you're enjoying it. I made it for you to enjoy, right? Two, this is kind of stupid, John. It's kind of stupid. And I began to put together where I'm now, probably about 20 minutes, because a little bit of current, so the river kind of carries you, not really fast, but a little bit, 20 minutes away from my takeout. And I begin to realize, hey, I'm standing soaking wet in the middle of a lightning storm, in the middle of a river, on not like a rubber paddleboard, on just a big piece of glorified foam. That's where I am. And I have the option, I can hold one lightning rod where I'm attempting to catch fish, yet that is still going terribly, or I can set that down and pick up another lightning rod. And I realize this probably wasn't the wisest decision for a Friday morning. (laughs) So what do I do? I take one more cast, because I gotta paddle back, I might as well try to catch fish on my way, right? I take one more cast, I put in this little holder thing I've got, I turn the paddle board around, and I paddle back, right? I paddle back. I get to the side, lightning struck this tree. No, I'm not kidding. That would have been terrifying. I would have cried. No, 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 that didn't happen, right? But I get back, I get to the takeout, soaking wet. I carry all my stuff. I'm running up this staircase to get to my truck. I take everything, I just throw it in the truck bed. I don't strap it down. I don't do anything like that. I jump in the car, soaking wet. And I sat there and I thought to myself, should have gone to see a movie should have gone to see a movie. Here's why I start there, right? Here's why I start there. That was not a wise decision. Was it fun? Yeah. Did it work out okay? Of of course. But was that wise? No. As Christians or people in general, we are constantly faced with, what would wisdom have me do? What would the wise decision be? Today, we're going to open scripture We're going to look at a section where the Apostle Paul, he's going to talk about, hey, here is what it looks like to walk. Here is what it looks like to live in wisdom. That's the goal for today. We'll think through. Should you go paddling out in the middle of a river and lightning storm? Maybe. Maybe you should go see a movie. How do we apply that to our lives? Here's why I think this talk matters so much. Right? So here, let me ask you guys a question. Let's go ahead. We're, we're bold people. We'll raise our hands. Who here likes being happy? Okay. I'm pretty sure that's unanimous. If not, we have a connecting card. I'd love to talk with you about that. Right? Okay, so we all like being happy. Happiness comes with what as Christians we would say out of faith. But where faith then lends itself to is wisdom. How you go through life, you can tell based on people's contentment, Peace and joy. Have they walked in wisdom? And and, and that's true whether you believe in Jesus Christ or you don't. So really what I'm putting forward for you today is if you're a Christian, hey, we want to talk about how do you take a next step to walk in wisdom? What does that look like? But if you're here and you're not a Christian, what I think you'll still hear, here are some amazing steps. Here's some principles you can apply to your life. And it will bring what Christians would share is a temporary happiness. And as you, what I hope, discover that, I hope it makes you think back on, man, I wonder what the source and the giver and and, and the gift of wisdom, where does that come from? We would say, our King, Jesus Christ. The section of scripture we're going to be looking at, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. You you can turn there. You can pull it up on your phone. We'll have it up on the screen here. You can do whatever you'd like. We're going to look at three characteristics of wisdom, uh, in particular of a wise 
Christian. The first one will be this. The wise know the value of time. The wise know the value of time. The second one, the wise know the will of God. You ever ask this question, what's God's will for my life? Nobody else? Okay, just me. Well, I'm going to answer that today, right? What is God's will for my life? And then the wise know the final thing. The wise know the heart of worship. Specifically, we'll talk about, hey, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? How does that evidence itself in your life? How does it evidence itself in mine? So again, we'll be in Ephesians 5. To set this up, if you've been tracking with us since about the start of the new year, you, you would know the book of Ephesians is just a letter written by a guy named Paul. Paul, he was an apostle. He was just a big-time church leader. He's writing to strengthen these Asian churches, right? Ephesus would have been in modern-day Turkey. He's sending them a letter that he hopes to get circulated. And he writes generally about two categories. The first three chapters of the book is he tells people, if you believe in Jesus Christ, here's how you are transformed. Here's how you are made new. Here's how in the eyes of God, you're loved, you're cherished. He doesn't just love you, but he likes you. He wants to spend time with you. Why? Because his son died for you. That, that's your first three chapters. A theme there, hey, that's your wealth. The next three chapters, how are we to live in, in response to a love like that? How are we to walk in love? So we talked about unity, and then this theme we've been in for a while in chapter five, it's holiness. Where so far the Apostle Paul, he's broken out holiness, where we're going into the third category of it. A few weeks ago, he talked about, hey, you must walk in love. Last week, we learned about you must walk in the light. What does that mean to expose the deeds of the darkness? And then this week, we're going to talk about what does it mean in holiness to walk in wisdom? That's where we are. So if you've got a Bible, turn with me. I'm going to read Ephesians 5. We're going to go verses 15 through 16, and then we'll stop. Sorry. <laughs> it's a weird sound. I already made it awkward, so I'm going to take another sip. Yeah. Welcome to the Springs. Okay, hey, let's look at this here. Verse 15, here, here, here let's come back in. Look carefully then how you walk. We, we've talked in the past, walk here, it just means how you live. The direction of your life is what he's talking about. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Verse 16, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. My first point out of this text today, the wise, they know the value of time. The wise know, they understand, they grasp the value of time. So if you've grown up in church, you may have heard this before. It was something I learned a few years ago and it was really helpful to me. In the Greek language, generally there's two words for time. There's two words. There's a word kairos and there's a word chronos. The word that's used here is kairos specifically. Kairos carried this idea of time as opportunity. Time as opportunity. Think almost uh, seize the day. Like it is time for me to go, to love, to serve, to care, to cherish, to get after it. Kairos, opportunity. And then there's one, chronos. Chronos is much more in terms of time as in duration, length of time, countdown clock. The Apostle Paul, what he's talking about right here is he's saying, hey, first thing that marks the wise, right, being careful, it means living precisely. A difference between the wise and the unwise is the wise, they value time. Because they see in time an opportunity, not a countdown clock. Does scripture teach elsewhere to the idea of, hey, it's good to have a countdown mentality? Yes. Psalm 90, teach me to number my days. There's an appointed number of days for your life. Maximize them. That's that heart. But this text, is that what that's teaching? No. It's saying right now, my daughter, when, when she's one, I have an opportunity to love and care for her and disciple her as a toddler. Hey, that I'm not going to have when she turns five. I won't have when she changes an eight. 
or she starts to really turn that corner around 11 where it starts getting real sassy. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right, turn that corner. So that's what I'm saying. It's an opportunity where you both understand, hey, how many days? But then how do I use those days well? I heard this. This blew me away this week. A mathematician, he compared the average lifetime with a single day. The average lifetime with a single day. So here's, here's this. The day would start at 7 a.m. and end at 12 p.m. If you disagree with his math, you can take it up with him. I'll send you the source. But just a general thought for you. If you're right now, if you're in here and you ducked out on the high school ministry and you're 15, right? If day started at 7 a.m., if the day started at 7 a.m. in your life, if life ends at midnight, it's 10.25 a.m. If you're 25, it's 12.42. If you're 35, it's 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock, you got nine hours. If you're 45, it's 5.16. If you're 55, it's 7.30. If you're 65, it's 10. If you're 70, it's 11 o'clock at night. Here's why that was helpful for me. It helped me see an understanding of, hey, one, my days are numbered, but two, how do I better capitalize on the kairos, the opportunity of time? Because, man, there's a clock that ticks. The way I think about it, I brought this illustration right here. Um, If you haven't seen it yet, I hope you can see it. This is my small, pink, feminine hourglass. And it is here to prove the point of chronos. Chronos, time and duration, the way often we think about it. We take our hourglass, we set it down, and we view life as a countdown clock. How long until I find a boyfriend? Then maybe I'll be happy. How long until we get married? Then I'll be happy. How long until we have kids? Then I'll be happy. How long until we really get the house I always wanted? Then we'll be happy. How long until, oh my gosh, my kids, they're not, they're not little, they're not toddlers. They can finally take care of themselves. Then I'll be happy. How long until they get out of the house and we're empty nesters and I can again actually go on a date with my wife? How long until I reach retirement age and I've watched that 401k vest? And I just can't wait. I'm moving to Florida. I'm going to buy a boat, sit on the beach. How long? Kronos. Here's the way I think about Kairos. Here's the way I'm asking you guys to think about it. This is a soaking wet towel. Soaking wet towel. The way I want you to think about time is not like the hourglass. It's like the soaking wet towel where you view it with the sense of opportunity, where you view it with the sense of what would God have me do, where he has given me so much. And with each instance with my family, I'm going to wring it out, man. I'm going to get every ounce. With the discipleship of my kids, I'm going to wring it out. I'm going to get every ounce. With the care and my stewardship of work, I'm going to wring it out. I'm going to get every ounce. With my time, my relationship with God, I will come and I will wring it out and I will get everything I can. Why? Because he loves me. And in his love, that's what wisdom would have me do. Kairos. Not Kronos. Is there anything wrong with Kronos? No, it's helpful. But this text is saying, church, ring it out. Die faithful, right? Let's keep going. Let's keep looking at the text. All right, we're gonna jump back in. We're gonna pick it up here, verse 17. Verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So in the verse before, he said unwise to wise. Here he's just going to call what unwise is. It's, it's senselessness. It is foolishness. He's going to say, don't be foolish. How do you not be foolish? You understand the will of God. My second point, the wise know the will of God. The wise know the will of God. Whenever you have this conversation, you got to be real careful in to break this out. The first thing I do is let's talk about what does it mean biblically to be foolish? What what does that carry? What I'm going to do is we're not going to show them all up here. I'm going to work through just some of the top verses 
that came to mind as I thought about this topic. What does it mean to be foolish? I'll tell you what they mean, and I'll tell you where to find them. But in general, here's foolishness. Foolishness is any time before faith and after where you say, my way, not yours. Right? The fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. What, what that means is not out of terror, not out of, oh gosh, I can't be around you, but out of, he's God, I'm not. His way's the way, not mine. That's the heart. So here, let's look at what does it mean to be a fool? Here's some of the things I found. A fool, they don't fear God. That's Proverbs 1.7. A fool hates knowledge. They hate truth. Proverbs 1.22. A fool, they destroy themselves through sexual immorality. A fool isolates themselves. They do their own selfish desires. A fool wants only their voice heard. Doesn't listen to the input the advice, the counsel, or the thoughts of others. Y'all know any fools yet? Right, here's the trick question. You're the fool. I'm the fool. I was before faith, and I still can be after faith. Let's keep going. A fool, they don't use language to build up. They use perverse language, Proverbs 19.1. A fool doesn't learn from their mistakes, mistakes, but like a dog to its vomit, they go back, Proverbs 26.11. A summary, the fool either lived a direction of a life, what I mean by that is without faith, or even in faith, they still relapse into. Psalm 14, 1. They live as if, they say as if, there is no God. A great way to think about this is, who is in charge of your life? Is it God or is it whatever you want? Is it, is it God sometimes and whatever you want most of the time? Or is it, hey, no, God's in control. Sure, I mess it up. I'm imperfect. Thank God for grace and redemption by faith. But man, I am striving to not live as a fool. That's what Paul's saying. Don't be foolish. And one of the ways you combat that is you understand the will of God. Whenever you talk about the will of God, you got to be real uh, clarifying with people. Because with God, you got to talk about two wills. So we're not going to overdo this. So the theology people that really can't wait to talk about all this, we're going to stay practical, right? Two wills. There's secret and there's revealed, okay? Secret, that's the thoughts of God you and I will never know. We can use his word to inform what we think those thoughts might be, but the secret things of God belong to him and him alone. That, that's that. Right? Some of the ways that impacts your life. Where should I work? What kind of car should I buy? How much debt should we take on a home? Right? Should, my, should my kids go to private, public, homeschool? Right? Do I buy Ford? Do I buy GM? Which one? What I mean there, that's God's secret will. He, I, don't, I don't think he cares. So don't try to seek that out. Use wisdom principles to discern. Talk with people. Pray. Right here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10, discerning what pleases the Lord. Romans 12, 2, that by testing you may discern the will of God. Do you all know that a lot of life's decisions, it's not a right and a wrong. It's a right and a left. If you don't know what to do, do you have a leaning? Right? If there's no sin... If wisdom doesn't, it kind of almost point you in the right direction, just pick one. And at the end of it, if it doesn't work out, see if you can go back and do the other. Right? Freedom. There. So that's the secret will of God. The revealed will, though, this is the part where a lot of people, man, do they want to know the secret. But what is God's heart for them? To know, to love, and to live the revealed. The revealed, I'd break out in two categories. The first one, God's will for every person is that they would believe in him. Here's what they would believe, that God is in heaven and he loves every person. He he created them. He's holy, he's just, and he's gracious. Yet you and I, we choose to go our own way. We rebel. We, We defy God. And in response to defying God, there's a separation. Why? Because he's holy, he's just. Justice must do something about sin, and we are the sin. 
But God didn't want to do justice to us because he knew to do that would mean we'd spend eternity apart from him. So, so instead, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, chose to come to live a perfect life and where he would die a death. And in that death, right, he would pay the penalty for every defiant moment, every time where I returned to be a fool, every ounce of the sexual immorality that marked my past. He died for it all. He died for every ounce of the lustful intentions that will come in my future. Died for it all. He rose from the grave three days later to prove this is true. And then his will is for me, for you, for every person. Belief. You must know the will of God, and it starts with belief. Right? And that's essential because a lot of people, where they go from is they skip belief, or they think they have belief, and then they try to move on to the next part. And that's where we create confusion, like confusion I walked in for years. That next category out of that, of God's revealed will, I'd just call grow. Growing in faith. The heart of the Christian life is to look more and more like Jesus. Jesus is everything. Jesus is the one we want to talk about. Jesus is the one we want to celebrate. And to do that, I think about it with three words. Why? Because I'm just simple-minded. Love God. Trust God. Obey God. Love God. Trust God. Obey God. What's God's will for your life, Christian, that you'd love him more? that you would trust him more and you'd follow after him with everything you got. Sometimes we get so lost in what is the secret will. God, what, what specifically do you want for my life? Do I do this? Do I do that? And then we miss the, hey man, spend time with God, fall more in love with God, love your spouse, disciple your kids, be a faithful neighbor, work with excellence at work as a form of worship, and then come home and go to bed. Right? Well, Watch a basketball game, watch the Astros play, enjoy. I love you. Get after it tomorrow. I can remember in middle school, I played football one year growing up. Eighth grade year, I'd always played like backyard football, hanging out with folks to where you go and you're throw, it's like a Nerf ball. Backyard football was as basic as everybody stood on a line, you said hut, another guy counted to five before he tried to tackle you, and everybody just ran. There was no real thought to it, complete madness, and it was awesome. And then you just try to throw it before you get tackled. That was the way I grew up playing football. All of a sudden, I show up. It's eighth grade. By eighth grade football, there's positions, there's plays, there's multiple coaches. There's all these kinds of things that I had no idea about. The position they put me at, so I was a running back, right? So they just gave me the ball, and I was supposed to run. But there was this play. I can remember it. Man, it bothered me. 189 sweep right. I don't think we were supposed to say the right part out loud. I was just supposed to know 189, go to the right. So all that means is, it's real simple. Quarterback says hut, gets the ball, hands me the ball. I take the ball, and I run that way. Here's where it got complicated for me. I was supposed to, as I ran, run right behind the tight end this position on the field, run right behind the tight end in between a wide receiver on the outside. It was going to move inside and block to where there'd be a hole for me to run through. But here's the problem. I didn't know where the tight end was. I didn't know where the wide receiver was because right beside this receiver was another receiver. And then sometimes the quarterback would do this thing, right? Still haven't figured that out, this thing, and then there'd be another one. So all of a sudden I have three pockets to hit and I don't know which one to go to. Very complex for me, right? For those of you that played football, I have lost respect in your eyes. That's fine. I'm good with that, right? All that to say is it was complex. I didn't know which one to hit. I can remember I kept going to the wrong one all of a sudden, and then I'd get there as I'd start to run, and I was like a deer frozen in the headlights because I was like, do I go there? Do I go there? Do I go there? And the coach finally figured out, all right, Omquist, simple-minded. So he just looked at me and said, hey, son, right? You're, you're son to everybody who's a football coach. Hey, son, yes, sir. Hey, here's the deal. If you don't know where to go, just remember, north and south. North and south. Your job is to just try to get down there. Do that best you can if you get lost. North and south. So I can remember, I'd get the ball, and I can remember just thinking, north and south, just run that way. Right? <laughs> Took me back to the times where you just say hut, and you ran. And you saw what happens. It was so helpful. It was so helpful. 
Here's where Christians get mixed up. They want to know every play. They want to know every gap in the line and where they're supposed to go and what exactly to do. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But here's what I'm saying. North to south. North to south. Major in what God has revealed. Major in faithfulness to him. Don't try to minor in the peculiarities of the faith. So what I mean by that is if you're this theological whiz in these areas of how the world ends, what is the specific role of the church in this world, God's sovereignty and our free will, if you've got all that yet, your kids feel distant, your wife feels neglected, your time with God out of a heart that just says, man, you're king and I'm here to follow, how can I serve? The way you treat the employees around you, your boss, your subordinate, it's not marked by that. Here's what I'm telling you. You're not living in the will of God. Wise men, wise women know the will of God. North to south. Let's finish the text. Let's go 18 to 21. I'm so excited for this part. Do not get drunk with wine. If it's beer, you're fine. Okay, let's keep going. No, completely kidding. Hey, some of you just woke up. A bunch of people are like, I'm never coming back. Yeah, I get it. No, no, no. We'll talk about that too. Right, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine. That's debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then this last phrase, man. Submitting to one another. That just means living in subjection to living humbly, where you look at others and you say, hey, I will honor your wishes. Submitting to one another out of reverence for who? Who do you do all this for? Out of reverence for Christ. Reverence for Christ. So y'all, hey, here's my third point. The wise, they know the heart of worship. The wise know the heart of of worship. Here's why I choose that one. All of this flows from your heart. Being filled with the Spirit impacts the heart. Worship, that's the way you live. That's all that is. Is that when we come and we gather and we sing songs? Yes, but that's also every moment when you walk out these doors and you go to serve on behalf of God Almighty, Monday through Saturday, and then come here to once again remind ourselves what is true. The wise know the heart of worship. First thing we got to look at, hey, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? What does that mean? Because here, here, here's my opinion. A lot of people wrongly teach this. A lot of people. And so I'm coming to you with humbly, and I'm going to say, I'm going to teach you the right way. Right? I'll teach you the right way. To, to simply put it, to be filled with, it means to be controlled by. To be filled with means to be controlled by. I heard a pastor once teach it this way where he said, hey, you're filled with the Spirit when you know. The Spirit is your master. You are meshed with the Spirit. And then there was a third M that I can't remember right now, but it was also very helpful to me. That will bother me, and I'll come back to it in a second, right? But that is a component of being filled with. Here's the way I think about it. A lot of folks will teach that the Holy Spirit, it comes in phases, it comes in forms, no. It comes at the moment you believe. You're sealed with it. He's not saying, hey, be resealed with the Spirit. He's saying, be filled with, be controlled by. What that looks like is a lot of times people will think about the Holy Spirit the same way they think about the gas for their cars, right? They'll think about, hey, I need to go to a gas station, right? Because I've been going for a while. My Holy Spirit meter's depleted. I need to refill it. God, come refill me. I need to be on fire again for God. Here's all I'm saying. Are there moments in faith when emotionally feels like a peak in a valley? Yes. Welcome to the Christian life. Right? But to view the role of the Holy Spirit that way is incorrect. The Holy Spirit does not come and it does not go. But what we do is Holy Spirit fills us, controls us, seals us at the moment of belief. And then we yield to it. We yield. So don't think gas stations where you go and it fills you up. Think this. Every time you drive and you see a yield sign, that's your job 
on behalf of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what transforms you. The Holy Spirit is what changes you. The Holy Spirit is the promise of Christ. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. It's the greatest gift you've ever been given by faith. But it's not the gas station. It's the yield sign. It's the moments when you and I stop and say, hey, who's leading me? Is it me? Or is it God? As, as I examine my life, who is in charge of my life? It's being filled with that spirit. It's being controlled by. Another reason why, here's what this means is, you guys know, what does it mean when someone is filled with anger? They're, they're controlled by their anger. What does it mean when someone is filled with rage? All of a sudden, anger has gone to a next level. Filled with jealousy, they're controlled by it. God, he's right here. He's saying, hey, don't get drunk. Why? Because when you're drunk, you give control over to something else. We all, if you've ever been drunk, pray you never have, right? But if you have, I did it once, right? <laughs> nah, a few more times than that, right? But you essentially, in essence, you're giving control over to something else. And he's saying, don't do that. Why? Because he'd instead have the heart of worship. And what is that heart marked by? The heart that's yielded, the heart that gives control to the Holy Spirit. It shows up in four ways. He gives you four gifts here. I love this. The first one we see here, it pops up addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Here's what that means. They speak truth. Psalms, a lot of folks think this literally means like psalms in your Bible. Hymns, these were doctrinal truths that people sung over themselves. Spiritual songs. That was taking good music and making it about Christ. That's the first thing they're marked by. They speak truth. Second thing is, he switches to their life. They sing and make melody to the Lord with their heart. Man, they sing praises. You ever been around folks? To where it's almost strange how much they have a heart of man. God, you have come. You have saved amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. The heart of worship is a heart that is yielded. A heart that is filled by the Spirit. Right? And that Spirit lends itself to praise. The third one. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father. The heart that's yielded is a grateful heart. It gives thanks. Like, if I were to ask you, are you marked by contentment? Are you marked by gratitude? Do you spend your days fantasizing, dreaming about what you wish you had? Or do you spend your days with a heart of, like Psalm says, the boundaries have fallen for me in pleasant places? They give thanks. And then the fourth, this is the one that makes us nervous. This is the one, verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So submission, we'll talk about that next week. Submission, the word itself, it carries this tremendously negative connotation in our culture. It's this idea in particular, husband, wives, and y'all need to hear this. If you're a wife, here's what submission does not mean. It in no way teaches a form of inferiority to where you are to remain subject to tyrannical dictatorship a jerk of a husband, to where you in some way lose personality, where you're less gifted, less capable, less of a leader, doesn't mean any of that. So if you want to know what it means, come back next week. But here's what this says for about every Christian. This word right here, submitting, right? It's this idea of being subject to one another. Like your life. Are you marked by humility? Like is there a desire in you of teachability, to when people come into your life, where when folks are around you, you're marked by a sincere sense of, I would honor them over me. When folks come and they speak truth, even though it's the truth you don't want, do you hear them? Or are you, like we learned before, the fool? A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing their own opinion. Proverbs 18.2. The heart of worship Walking in wisdom, we live humbly. We live in subjection with one another. Do you track with that? He, there were two ways that I really saw this show up in my life. There was a season in my life, and specifically I'm going to use alcohol as a theme throughout here. There was a season, 18, 19, I don't know, 20, 21, 22, I don't know exactly. 
somewhere in there where I can remember there was kind of two versions of me. There was sober John and there was drunk John. I became a Christian right about 22 or 23. Sober John and drunk John. And I can remember thinking to myself, hey, tonight I'm going to drink so much I just stop thinking. Because when I stop thinking, I gave control over to, hey, there's another guy that will show up. He doesn't care. I was tired of caring. I wanted to be filled with something else. And I went in a wrong direction that brought a lot of pain into my life. Years later, I came and I became a Christian. And alcohol, I would never claim to be an alcoholic, but alcohol, it, it had this theme in my life where I realized, hey, I use that to check out. I didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know what that meant for my life. So for about, what I believe, two to three years, somewhere in there, it was a, hey, I'm just not drinking. I have no idea how I'm supposed to treat alcohol. I don't know what that looks like in my life. So my conscience, it it was not fully convinced, as Romans 14 would say. And so because of that, wisdom had me, hey, just lay that down. Don't mess with it. So for a season, I didn't want anything to do with it. And then there was a season this past week, right? Or no, I'm sorry, after that, I can remember uh, drank a mimosa on my honeymoon. I drank some wine. Why? Because just before that, I'd been with friends where I'd had a discussion with a group of men who loved me and cared for me. And I said, hey, guys, I lay this before you. If you guys want to take this off the table, that's fine. Make no provision for the flesh. I'm down. We'll take it off. What you say, I will live in subjection to. But hey, here's why I think I can go and I can have a beer with you guys. Here's why I think I can go and have a mimosa in Cancun with my wife. And we started to talk through it. And it became these ideas of, hey, are people around me in those moments who love God, who know my past, and want to help? And if so, okay, hey, John, are you drinking the beer because you want to somehow fit in? Or are you drinking the beer because in reality you're just trying to take the edge off? If so, man, you got Holy Spirit for that. You're just coping. Or is it, hey, man, you like the taste of a beer. And at that point, wisdom had me, right? I made the decision, hey, have a taste of the beer. By the grace of God, haven't been drunk since before I was a Christian. Right? There was one time on a, I came a little close, but stopped and ran, right? But I share that because wisdom changed that through different phases. Wisdom may change that in the future phase. My job is to fight to daily be controlled by the Spirit. Do y'all see that? Don't give control to something else. Give control to the Holy Spirit and then even in humility and subjection to others as you come and say, God, your will be done, not mine. Let's recap. Jesus Christ calls us. Paul in this letter says, hey, walk in wisdom. He gives three characteristics, three marks to the wise, right? He says the wise, they know the value of time. They ring it out. The wise They know God's will. They focus on his revealed will and the way that they live by faith. They love, they trust, they obey. And then third, the wise know the heart of worship. They come and they say, hey God, when I I see, I yield to you and to you alone. You're, You're king, man. Help me to speak truth. Help me to sing praises. Help me to give thanks. Help me to live humbly. Why does the Spirit bring that about? Let me free up everyone in here. Why does the Holy Spirit bring that about? None of us are that good at it. It's a spiritual act. We all, beholding the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Spirit is the greatest agent of help in our lives. So to summarize all this, y'all, there's something that really stuck with me this weekend, right? It it just stuck with me in a way of thinking, okay, what is the real benefit to you? What is the real benefit to me? To walk in wisdom is to walk in freedom. Right here, just track with me. To walk in wisdom is to walk in freedom. Here's why I mean that. Again, if you remember where we started, what would wisdom have you do? If you don't know Jesus Christ, there's one who freedom comes through. His name is Jesus. All you have to do, it's not behave. It's not pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You don't have bootstraps. It's to believe. To believe he loves you and your sin and my sin led to his death. Yet he rose again to prove, hey, if you trust in me, all 
will be made well. And he says, believe. Freedom comes by faith. That's the first step of wisdom. But out of that too, if you know your Bible, you know Galatians 5, it would say, hey, for freedom you've been set free. Therefore, do not submit again to the yoke, the bondage of slavery. You were set free from your master. Don't go back. What keeps you and I from not going back? Wisdom. What keeps you and I from living? What I had a friend describe as the abundant life. Wisdom. So here's what I want to do. I want to share a story about a friend of mine as I invite the band back up. Right, there's a friend of mine, and she said it was fine if I shared her name. Her name is Paula Leverett. She's a member here. If you don't know Paula, she's phenomenal. But I had the chance to get to know Paula even over the past couple months and got to hear her story. Paula grew up in a family that, that knew about church, talked about Jesus, but there was no real active, no present faith there. Her mom passed away at the age of nine, and her dad, she remembers her dad saying this, your mom has gone to be with Jesus. So it was an idea of faith. They didn't go to church, but when she was a teenager, she started to go by herself. Why? She wanted to flirt and sit in the balcony with boys, right? So that's what took her. She ends up into college, jumping into nursing school. She got married young. Her husband at the time, he had a job, or he was a student. I don't remember exactly. He had a job or a student where they didn't see each other often. And Paula is a young woman, drifted from her husband's and stepped outside the boundaries of faithfulness. That led to Paula pursuing divorce. And in that moment of divorce, her husband, who was a Christian, and that was something Paula was attracted to and enticed by, he looked at her and he said, if you loved God enough, you could love me. And as a young woman, Paula said, don't you tell me how to love God. I felt that way. Paula went on in life and she moved on, got her nursing degree, continued on. She ended up finding a man. That man too was once divorced. Right, they got married, her husband Carrie, they're still together now, and it is a beautiful marriage. Right, one of the things that happened to Carrie is he became injured and ill while they were married. And in that injury, a physician shared his faith with Carrie. Carrie came to trust Christ, to know Christ. His life began to change. He began to walk in wisdom with a heart of worship. Paul looked at her husband and said, man, I want that. All of a sudden, Carrie, he shared with her a, uh, uh, a tape, a tape of a preacher teaching on the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation, that preacher, bless that guy, he taught on the topic of divorce. If divorce is a part of your story, there's no guilt and shame here. Find the freedom that comes from Paula, right? You hear me, don't tune out. What Paula heard through this teaching is her marriage had been a covenant and in that moment what she realized is, hey, that entire divorce I'd explained away from I was young We never saw each other. There were no kids, so it wasn't really that big of a deal. But it was in that moment as she's learning through the book of Revelation that God lovingly introduced himself to her by her realization of, it was my sin that did that. It was my sin that ended that. And in that moment, she realized, I am a sinner in need of a savior. And regardless of my past, God, you love me. And you want to take my heart, you want to transform it, you want to help me be new, walk in a newness of life. And she and Carrie changed. They began to walk in love. They began to walk in light. They began to walk in wisdom. She got into a Bible study where they worked through the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew begins to talk about conflict resolution and what to do with it. And in that process, She remembers going through and realizing God has called me to make amends with my ex-husband. God has called me. Carrie, her husband, he realized God has called me to make amends with my ex-wife. And in that moment, Carrie, he goes and he makes amends peacefully. But Paul, where she was, where her ex-husband was, it just wasn't the right time. She waits and she says this prayer, God, I want to walk in wisdom. If you want that to happen, will you help that come about? A few years later, her ex-husband was driving through town. Called Paula's then husband and said, hey, may I talk to Paula? He says, absolutely. Paula prays with Carrie, her husband, and then goes to meet with her ex. And her ex looks at him, looks at her, and he says, hey, what is wrong with me? He'd had a second failed marriage at this point. I, I don't know why this keeps happening. And Paula shared with him something that she'd learned through wisdom. She'd learned through. She'd used her time differently to learn the will and the word of God. She'd used her time differently to understand, hey, what is a heart of worship? 
Why would I show up to McDonald's even if it's years later? Why would I really trust God enough to walk by faith even in the parts that is most difficult? And Paula shared with him. She said, hey, you once said that if I loved God enough, I could love you. I told you you were wrong. Let me tell you, you were right. I was wrong. It was my sin. It was my lack of faithfulness in the God I now know. Will you forgive me? And in that moment, God smiled. He'd been smiling on Paul and Carrie for years, but he smiled in the faithfulness of a daughter who had used the time before as an opportunity, who had used the time before to learn what really is the will of God? How would he have me live? Would he really have me do things like that? Would he really have me, as Paul described her life, wake early in the morning to meet with him? Here's the thing. He, of course, forgave her. And then here's what Paul described. She says, John, imperfectly, imperfectly, I have been living the abundant life. There's a God in heaven who's come, and all he wants to do is give you the abundant life. That's it. That's all he wants to do. He wants you to walk by faith and in faith find wisdom and in wisdom be free. You know what Paula carried for years that she doesn't carry now? That. You know what Paula lives in? Freedom as she continues to walk by wisdom. Sing with me and then we'll get out of here.